Ladies and gentlemen, we will now be cooking and talking about innovations in a women's health, starting from the digital birth care techniques to affordable products and fertility tracking apps, something that's rapidly transforming the health space and more. Well, we're going to be actionably talking around creating opportunities for investment and scaling women health startups. That's Femtech. We'll be solving problems with our specialists and the experts who are going to be just here on the screen right in a few moments of the women healthcare by innovation and technology. Well, yes, affordable and accessible solutions for reproductive health, tools and techniques for wellness and nutrition, and the digital applications for, di for disease control and also management. Allow me to please rope in for the inaugural leaders dialogue, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be feisty. So let's please welcome our session moderator, uh, Priyanka Agarwal, the managing director and partner from Boston Consulting Group, would be joining us and holding the strings of the conversation. Let me please uh, very warmly invite our panelist, Dr. Alexander Thomas, the founder, member, and president Association of Healthcare Providers. Warm, warm welcome. Let's also welcome Dr. Om Manchanda, the managing director of Lal Pat Labs, with a round of cheer. Let's welcome Dr. Sunita Maheshwari, ABP, ABPC, USA, senior consultant, pediatric cardiologist, and chief dreamer and loop closer, RXDA and teleradiology solutions. Let's also welcome our next and the final panel member, Dr. Atul Mohan Kocha, MD, DNB, MN, AMS, FAAD, the Chief Executive Officer, ladies and gentlemen, National Accreditation Board for Hospitals and Healthcare Providers, that's NABH, as we all know. So with that, Priyanka, you got to do some heavy duties. I'm straight away handing it over to you. Thank you so much, Shikha, and thanks for having us. Uh, this is indeed uh, a very critical topic as we talk about healthcare in India. Um, as we perhaps all know, India fares amongst the worst in gender equality in the world. Uh, United Nations Development Index had ranked India as 132 out of uh, 187 nations in gender inequality. And gender is one of the most uh, important social determinants of health. Uh, Dr. Swati was just uh, sharing a lot about uh, the critical importance of uh, women in not only managing their own health care, but being as the focal point of managing the health care of their families, uh, which is why gender is actually ranked first as, uh, you know, in the criticality of social determinants of health. Uh, another study I was reading a, a few days ago actually said that only about 37% of women uh, in India get access to health care. Uh, which is uh, due to a combination of reasons, I guess, women have le less, uh, they, they often ignore their own, own illnesses, we see less health seeking behavior uh, in women. Um, and then, you know, even in terms of resource allocation within the household or even in the public arena, uh, women tend to suffer um, in terms of uh, their access to health care. And this becomes even more, um, I think, uh, you know, critical and, and, and visible as we've all gone through the last, uh, you know, many months of this pandemic, where, um, you know, um, it has only, the pandemic has only brought to the fore the many, many inequalities in healthcare, including, including gender inequality. So with that backdrop, I, uh, you know, we have um, a lot of uh, elite members today to share their perspectives on both the issues that face us, but also more importantly, the seeds of the solutions uh, in, in creating affordable solutions, uh, creating innovative technological uh, you know, oriented solutions in, in progressing uh, towards the goal of women's healthcare. Uh, so with, without further ado, let me just uh, invite uh, maybe to begin with Om, uh, who of course heads uh, Dr. Lal, um, Path, uh, Dr. Lal Path Labs and therefore has seen perhaps a large volume of, uh, you know, tests and therefore what are the kind of issues that he sees uh, coming up from those tests in terms of women's uh, issues. So maybe that that's a good frame to start. Om, if you could share on what are the critical issues that you see in women's healthcare from your vantage point um, and, and therefore we'll progress the discussion from there. So very good morning and thanks Priyanka. So I think when, when I was asked to speak on this subject, so I thought the best starting point is to do deep dive into some data that we have for the last couple of years. And I'll try and share some insights that are coming and maybe that will 
set the tone for the conversation on this panel. So uh, my take is that women's uh, healthcare needs are often accompanied by considerable hormonal changes. I think that's uh, at the center of a lot of these medical issues that we see and throughout uh, various life stages. And I have tried to analyze in about four buckets. So first is puberty, then reproductive stage, and then pre and post menopause and elderly years. What I have what I've found is that, uh, in fact, interesting sort of finding is that nearly 55% of our testing actually is coming from female gender. Uh, that tells you that the amount of testing which is happening around these issues. And nearly half of this actually comes from 40 years and above. So it also tells you that a lot of medical issues are actually cropping up uh, after 40 years of age. The, the another key observation that I see from the data is that across all age groups, thyroid profile is the number one test. Uh, and this particular thyroid disorders are linked to many of, uh, and it's, it's commonly known that it's very common disorder amongst females. And it is important cause of menstrual irregularity, infertility and mood swings, etc. And during pregnancy also, uh, thyroid gland plays a very important role. Now, I'll actually spend a little time on each of these stages and try and give you as to what my observations are from the data that we have. Uh, at puberty level, thyroid and polycystic ovary syndrome, these two things are most commonly sort of a medical condition that we have seen. During reproductive phase, I find that two commonly ordered tests are anti-Mullerian hormone, which is AMH, which actually is a fertility marker. Uh, it is, is very commonly ordered test. And maternal serum scans, which actually tells you about fetal sort of a health and if what is the medical condition of during the pregnancy stage. Then we move to the menopause phase where I see that in addition to thyroid, vitamin D becomes a very important test. And it's clearly linked to calcium and, and bone health issues and osteoporosis. I think that's the time some of these medical conditions start appearing. In the last one, which is elderly care, we find that cervical and breast cancer, these two are very important conditions which crop up. So if I were to summarize two or three medical conditions which are of a very high significance, number one, thyroid disorders. Number two, I would say uh, conditions that are linked to fertility and pregnancy management. Number three, I would say uh, during menopause, uh, vitamin D or calcium deficiency. And the lastly about breast and cervical cancer. I think that is that lays the framework of what are the issues that we I notice from the data that we have. Fair enough, thanks. So maybe um, you know I'll I'll go over to you, Doctor Alexander, from your work on SDGs and from what Om described. You know, would would you you know what would you say are the key priorities when we think about women's healthcare in India, and also you know your comments on the health seeking behavior itself of women for these for these uh, you know health conditions, which we often know you know, that, that they neglect their own health and so on. So we'd, we'd love to hear some perspectives from you. Thank you, Priyanka. And uh, once again, good morning to all of you. Uh, all over the world, and especially in our country, especially during this COVID pandemic, women continue to be the cornerstone in any home. And I think this is, uh, uh, all of us know this. I remember my time and I was CEO of a hospital and we had mainly 70% uh, were women. And I always used to admire them because they always came for a shift after a shift at home. I think very few of us remember this, that they come to work, form work and go back to work. So I think it's really important as a country, we take care of our women and uh, especially we take care of them, especially during uh, pregnancy. So I think I'll just, I'll, I'll focus myself uh, uh, on pregnant women, I think that's an uh, aspect that uh, I'm a little familiar with, having worked with the government of Karnataka in various uh, areas. Sorry. Yeah, so um, uh, I thought I'd just work on two points. 
one is uh, uh, both related to uh, pregnancy and um, uh, uh, women's health. Uh, the health of the woman and the health of the next generation also depends on this. So that is why it's very important that as a country we focus on this. Now, one area that we have been working on for a long time is uh, maternal uh, mortality. And I think we can relate this to the number of ultrasound scans that is being done. All of us know that an ultrasound is something which is very basic, which is needed for a uh, woman in uh, pregnancy. And it is recommended usually that uh, three scans be done during this period. But I think the government of India has at least recommended one scan. Unfortunately, only 24% of our population, according to one study, 24% of our pregnant mothers are able to get this. And as a result of this, you have uh, increased maternal mortality and increased uh, child mortality. One reason for this is uh, scans the shortage of radiologists. I think policies have changed. The PCPNDT Act needs to be uh, looked at again. We need to look at uh, opinions among the radiologists, among the doctors. Because though on paper, the MPPS people are allowed to do scans, I think it hasn't somehow uh, gone to the grassroots. And if you look at the situation today, many, many of our pregnant women, especially in the rural areas, are not getting this. And I think this is one area which we can focus on and can do something very quickly. The second area on which I'll focus on, and I think uh, which is very important, is uh, anemia in pregnancy. I think the recent Niti Aayog uh, report came out and I feel very ashamed that even after 75 years of dependence, in five states, more than 50% of the pregnant women between 15 and 45 years are anemic. Uh, Kerala, the best state in this, uh, has one in five, 20%. I think this uh, to all of us would be unacceptable because it has a lot of uh, implications. The health of the mother, um, the immunity of the mother, the health of the uh, child. And unfortunately, I think India tops the list of nations with the most anemic uh, women and uh, children. Though in 2018, we had started, the uh, government of India had started a scheme called uh, Anemia Mukt Bharat. Uh, I don't think we have made much progress. So I think what is the solution? For I think this is also very low hanging fruit. And we must, as a country, ensure that we do something about it, because this is a shameful fact. Uh, I think the uh, uh, use technology for point of care diagnosis, uh, find out the exact, the data, how many people are affected. We need to use tech as a tech, in, a tech enabled uh, services, you use more of point of care devices. And, and one of my um, colleagues in Gaini had said that the three T's, test, treat, and talk. Uh, you um, uh, uh, test uh, for anemia, find out uh, what is the situation, treat with vitamins, with iron, and talk. I think when the community needs to be made aware of this, this is so uh, important. And it's not very difficult because I think uh, iron and folic acid programs uh, is very easy, even as a prophylactic measure, uh, we need to sensitize this. So I think in conclusion, I'd like to say that um, uh, also, I mean, gender equality, as somebody was mentioning, we have laid down in the, in the list. So I, I think as a nation and as a culture, our women are a pride. I think we need to remember this in India. And I, you know, they're very, very vital to the healthcare of our nation. I think there's no two things about it. And I think we need to realize this. And uh, I'm sure that our country will make rapid progress if we take care of uh, our women and if we empower them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Um, that is, um, maybe let me pick up on the point that uh, you were speaking about, uh, you know, neonatal and pregnant women care. Uh, Dr. Sneeta, when we were talking earlier, you had spoken about, you know, some of the innovations that you are seeing in, uh, you know, either remote monitoring or teleradiology. And maybe that is one of the unlocks or one of the most critical SDG goals, which is maternal mortality and uh, even, even actually infant mortality. Um, so if you could share your thoughts on what innovations have you seen, which can be dramatically scaled, which can move the needle on, on this one most important indicator, um, that would be great. So oh, yeah, thank you, uh, Priyanka. Thank you, Femina and uh, E.T. Uh, nice to be a woman on this panel uh, discussing women's issues. I think, you know, there, there, there are plenty of issues that we need addressing. Uh, I think, you know, to take off from uh, what um, Dr. Thomas and what uh, Dr. Manchanda had mentioned, you know, about where can we use tech really for women? Um, 
And some of it is low tech and some is going to be really high tech. Uh, now, in terms of what Dr. Thomas was talking about, where you know we have a lack of ultrasounds, for instance, for pregnant women. One of the issues is that while we may train an MBBS doctor to do a basic ultrasound, uh, they may need support by someone who's more experienced. And that support may not be there in either a rural area or a tier three city. So that is something that tele, teleradiology, and that's an area we've been working on the last 20 years in India, where teleradiology can come in. Uh, and doesn't necessarily have to be radiology. So teleradiology is where you take the scan, which is done at one place, transmit it to another place where you have an experienced radiologist doctor. But the same can be applied, for instance, telecardiology. You've got technologists who are doing the echo, but you know they're confused about what they're seeing, and it can be transmitted to a cardiologist in the cities to give an opinion. So I think the, the, the whole idea of, of telediagnostics, and I, I'm not stepping into you know, Ohm's place of, of uh, lab tests, but telediagnostics in terms of imaging, uh, you know, whether it's uh, radiology, whether it's echoes, whether it's ECGs, all of that today, you can have your specialists concentrated in the cities if you like, because that's where they want to be. Yet you can get their expertise out to women all over the country who need it. You know, similarly to Ohm's point about thyroid, uh, you know, if you have a thyroid issue, you either need a good internist uh, or an endocrinologist, you know, or a very well-trained physician who's going to know what to do with that thyroid result and put you on medications and so on. Now today, and you know, after the pandemic, fortunately, telemedicine got legalized in India last March. So again, you can access your specialists from wherever you are and get their opinion. And I think that is hugely enabling today for women's health. Uh, I mean, if you look at the pandemic and all the women locked up at home, you know, where do you access your doc? Uh, wh what do you access? And that's where telemedicine has come in, in a huge way for them to be able to really sit in their bedroom, not tell their mother-in-law, their husband, and access a hormonal doc, an endocrine doc, you know, find a doc anywhere in the country uh, who can help them. So I, I think the tele is a big part today of technology enabling healthcare for women, wherever they may be. The other is kind of the much higher tech stuff that has come in, uh, like for instance, uh, breast cancer, when we talk about breast cancer detection, you know, mammography, there are not that many radiologists skilled uh, in mammography uh, who can actually interpret mammograms, make sure that it's a tumor and not like a benign lesion and calcium versus cancer. So that's where technology comes in. And today we've got, you know, artificial intelligence enabled breast cancer detection. So the algorithm can help you. Well, okay, not 100%, but 96%, you know, some better than, than before. And it's helping us improve our accuracy. Because I think one of the issues women, well, I would say all people face is they doubt the diagnosis, you know, is, so there's that doctor shopping, that diagnosis shopping, and I think that's where technology can come in to say, you know what, this has been looked at by a doc. It's also been looked at by AI. So you've got these kind of two pairs of eyes, one being tech and one being a human. Uh, and I think those are the interesting areas, I think, where tech is really entering in India today uh, in healthcare. And the last piece, because, you know, I'm a pediatric cardiologist, but a cardiologist nevertheless, is really the whole wearable space. You know, if you look at women today with their Fitbits and counting their steps, even while they're doing their housework, you know, that excitement of, okay, I went up and down, up and down, and I hit my 12,000 steps. Uh, I think that is, 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 if we can push that as a dialogue, and they're not that expensive when you consider you spend two, 3,000 and you're monitoring. I mean, today, some of the, app, the watches, smart watches have, you can monitor your ECG. So we know that women are equally at risk for heart disease as men are but they tend to not pay attention to it. Uh, so again, you know, wearables and those kind of tech today makes kind of that, that more accessible for women, that they can be considering looking at their heart as well, at their fitness levels, at their calorie intake, you know, at the whole thing that leads eventually to wellness. So I think I'll stop with that. As you can see, I can talk endlessly. So I know I have to let Dr. Atul in. 
So over to you, Priyanka. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Sneeda, for sharing that. In fact, a question has come in on the chat, uh, which provides us a good segue into that. So what you described, Dr. Sunita, a lot of these technologies exist and have existed for a while. You know, perhaps uh, teleradiology, even telecardiology uh, have existed for a while. So the question that has come in, and maybe that's where I'll bring in Dr. Atul. Therefore, then what are the barriers to dramatically scaling these innovations up? Why aren't we seeing improvement in, in some of these indicators when the technology has been available? And what will make us dramatically change? Uh, you know, what barriers do we need to solve to see a different shape and different uh, progress on these indicators in women's healthcare over the next five years? Yes, thank you, Priyanka. Thank you, Team AT. Thank you for this opportunity and raising the right kind of questions. And before I specifically come to the uh, the question which you raised and which has come in, Priyanka, please allow me to you the cliche and tell that uh, again that this pandemic has really changed the paradigms of healthcare, healthcare delivery, like like nothing before. Right. So all the established priorities, which Dr. Om, Dr. Alex, which rightly pointed out, you know, the anemia, malnutrition, uh, CAs, uh, the carcinoma of the cervix, breast, vitamin D. So all those are very much uh, still around, but they have suddenly gone into the shadows, if I can use that word. And suddenly the new paradigms, the goalposts have been uh, defined. And we all realize that the, the current pandemic has, has given rise to new challenges. Uh, so new challenges, uh, I mean, if I can name them as one is the work from home challenge, uh, which is suddenly brought into focus what Dr. Alex said, the mental health issues, right? So mental health, uh, because there's no emotional support, uh, the, the boundaries of time have become blurred. Uh, there are no coffee moments, or if, if somebody is lucky to retain a job, then uh, the entire working has become very, very monotonous. Uh, lack of support. So like women, uh, earlier they were going to work and coming back to work, but now there's no going at all. So I mean, they are managing the entire gamut in their own place. You know, uh, if you were to talk about a rural setup, I've been told that marriageable age is going down again. So, so somehow the circle has gone. The pandemic is not only emulating the uh, pandemic of uh, 1918, but also the social customs and cultures of uh, kind of taken precedence. But, but fortunately, as Dr. Sunita very rightly pointed out, there are so many opportunities, which Dr. Swati also mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, many may not be aware that prior to 25th March last year, 2020, it was not legal to give out a consultation online. So that's when the telemedicine guidelines came about. That's when the telemedicine became legal in the country. And now every health professional can give out not only advice or a prescription on any platform, including WhatsApp, if you may, or any other thing, but you are also free to diagnose and continue uh, with the CMEs, you know, continuing medical education, you are uh, free to launch into preventive healthcare strategy. And that is the only way to bridge the provider what's the providing gap, which unfortunately India has. For example, Dr. Sunita was saying that endocrinologists, they're hardly I mean, you can count them. I mean, there's hardly an N number of, uh, uh, I mean, a fixed number of endocrinologists or super specialists in any discipline. So the only way you can take these to tier two, tier five, tier six cities is by use of technology. The other thing which we have also noticed is that people have started realizing the other opportunity is the value of quality and quality accreditation. So today, NABH is proud to partner with 12,000 hospitals in various capacities and all these, and data will prove me right later on, that whichever hospital was following SOPs adapted to the changing dynamics very, very well. They could limit the morbidity, the mortality of their own healthcare staff. And today's healthcare staff, as everybody has concurred, comprises of more than, more than 50 to 60% of uh, women, actually, as a gender. They are the right front and center of every war. The school teachers, the ASHA workers, the nursing officers, what to talk about, uh, about doctors, professionals, right? So, so all these without compromising, I mean, with a huge compromise to their personal safety. So personal safety is another challenge and where we can use now the technology to not only take it to the masses, but also to uh, educate people because even the donning and doffing of PPE is a huge task. Uh, if you were to do a survey 
I mean, majority may be lacking in the right format. So their technology or a simple app can come in, which tells them how to wear a PPE, you know, how to doff it, how to discard it properly. And there are programs already running there. Coming to the question which you raised, and I think it's a very, very pertinent question, whoever has raised it, uh, technology comes with a huge responsibility. So it was already waiting in the wings. We do not deny that. But we have to take into account the realities and the diversities of what country uh, which we belong to, India. We are a developing country. We must not lose focus. Uh, so while we talk about the moon and talk about uh, these bullet trains and latest things, we have to also realize the unfavorable sex ratio. We, we, we cannot. We have to have a responsible system in place, standards in place, uh, which comment upon uh, which take control of the data which is coming in through wearables. All the digital ecosystem, I mean, tele, telemedicine is only one very small component of digital health. There is also M, M health, there's wearables, as Dr. Sunita rightly said, uh, there's healthcare facility registry, there's a mapping of everything. And fortunately, we now have another document called National Digital Health Blueprint, which, which charts out a framework, what we will follow over the next maybe a decade. It gives out for four years or five years, but it's a very, very succinct document, which clearly outlines what kind of technology you will use. So technology is already available. Uh, we only have to use it very, very responsibly. We have to mention very clearly what happens to the consent. Uh, it should actually empower, empower not only the consumers and not only the uh, doctors but also the healthcare staff and at the same time this technology should ensure that all data the privacy rule the the content is protected from all the predators because there are people waiting because data is, is the king and 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 used properly executed well there is no doubt that uh, the entire uh, population especially women of india are going to be beneficial. I mean, it's going to be a hugely glorious future if we could just, you know, channel this technology responsibly in a right manner and take it to the masses. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, remarks, Dr. Atul. I think you reminded us for sure that the pandemic has perhaps taken us back many years or many decades. Uh, who knows? We will find out. And on many indicators, we have regressed. Uh, so in many ways, this is a glass uh, half full or maybe three fourths full. But the but the but the challenge before all of us is to say that how we you know are there you know are there investments and initiatives which can help us rise from this ashes so to say, and from you know and, and I'll pose this question maybe to all of you if you had to place your top two priorities uh, and then we, you, you know the uh, how the outcomes will pan out perhaps only the future will tell but if we had to both you know gain back on a lot of regression that we've had in the last uh, in the last year or so in many health indicators including women but also leapfrog and use this um, opportunity to 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 uh, you know maybe uh, uh, like in 1991 many things happen in crisis so you know the telemedicine's and guidelines were passed in crisis and many other innovations maybe came to the fore in this crisis. So what would your top two priorities be to use this crisis as an opportunity to see if we can both come back and, and leapfrog? And maybe I'll pose this question to, to all of you um, uh, to, to at least look forward with optimism uh, from, from wherever we are. So maybe I can start uh, with you, Dr. Sunita. What would your top two priorities be? What, what should both the private sector, public sector focus on uh, and just give us your top two and we'll, we'll go around the room to at least look forward with optimism. Yeah, I think for me, uh, you know, being a, a healthcare entrepreneur where I've seen closely over the last two decades, technology and healthcare intertwine, I would say top priority for me would be telemedicine and ensuring that it continues even post the pandemic uh, because it, it is something that the pandemic allowed us in this country to use. Uh, and so, you know, I, I hope it's not forgotten uh, once we open up our hospitals and clinics again, uh, and that we continue to use it and grow it, and especially, uh, you know, multi-language telemedicine, uh, lower cost telemedicine, um, charitable telemedicine, uh, so it's, it's uh, we have so that we can come up with sustainable models for it. Uh, because as we know, hospitals, you know, use telemedicine because you convert a telepatient into an inpatient. But how can you grow telemedicine for the pure uh, you know, for purely telemedicine's sake. For that, you have to have 
it be a sustainable model. And I hope that grows and continues to impact even those who cannot afford it by having kind of a, a Robin Hood model, you know, charging patients who can afford to pay and not charging patients who are poorer and who cannot uh, afford it. So my top would be, you know, telemedicine to grow, thrive and be sustainable. The second I would say is uh, in India, as, as Dr. Atul said, you know, we now have data. Um, I mean, it's been incredible the kind of data we have with COVID, right? And if we took off from what Dr. Thomas mentioned about, you know, anemia, I mean, it's such a simple thing to, to, to really ensure no pregnant woman is anemic. But if we could use our data well in the next decade, use that data, so we know whether our pregnant women who are anemic, we make sustained campaigns to get them iron and folic acid. I mean, folic acid costs two rupees a day. And if you take it for three months before pregnancy, you reduce the chances of congenital heart by 7%. You drop the incidence of spina bifida. I mean, it's, a, it's an intervention that is basically 60 rupees a month, 180 rupees for three months to have such tangible benefits. And this is where I feel the power of data. If we have that data, we share that data, and then we make very, very focused public healthcare initiatives towards low-hanging fruits like anemia, folic acid deficiency. We can, and you know, things like vitamin D, everyone's checking their vitamin D levels. So you correct vitamin D levels, with that cold calciferol sachet, a couple of them in a year, hardly costs you a few rupees. And then you've got a whole population that's feeling less tired and more energetic and women who can do more. So I think these few interventions, you know, are really anemia, folic acid, vitamin D, and telly, 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 telly. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sunita, uh, for sharing those two very powerful ideas with an equal amount of passion, uh, telemedicine and use of data. Dr. Alexander, maybe I'll invite you to either add to those or you know, share your perspectives on if you had a clean, clean, clean uh, check, if you had a blank check, what would be the, your two top priorities to, to continue to progress? It is important uh, uh, that uh, we focus on the prevent. I'm looking at a broad picture and we've been actually dialoguing with government. I think these preventive and wellness clinics absolutely have to be uh, commissioned very soon. I think it's very important that there's a public-private partnership, a healthy public-private partnership like we have in Karnataka. And I also think that the government needs to have at least 50% of the healthcare delivery system under its control and make it accountable. Uh, we have institutions like Nimhans and Jaydeva doing excellent work. I think all institutions should uh, do that. Uh, and I think the biggest problem now, especially in the tier two and in the government setup is lack of specialists. I believe one estimate said there's an 80% um, uh, vacancy in the government. So it's like having a bus without a driver. So I think this is something that we have to uh, work on. It's very, very important. We've already started work. The NMC and national board have uh, helped. This is in the broad, in the broad scheme of things that we are able to give uh, uh, care to every uh, each of our citizens at the grassroots, and of course, underlying this, you need to use technology uh, for the uh, for accessible care and also for accountability. Thanks. I think accountability. Yes, I think that's perhaps uh, you know another discussion we were having on what healthcare reform overall, not just for women's healthcare, could be put on the table. At least learning from this, uh, you know, pandemic and accountability was a key theme. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, Om, your thoughts on the same, your top two priorities, if, if you look at this post-pandemic era, for especially women's health care. Yeah, I think one thing is becoming fairly clear that most uh, problems have solutions. I don't think we're dealing with challenges which we don't know what to do. But what I find the two gaps that exist today, one is a huge lack of awareness. So if I were to pick one very large initiative would be to create awareness. Now, it technology really helps. I find a lot of groups nowadays being formed. I think if it's initiative driven from the center or from the government or a private sector of women groups and create a massive awareness about day-to-day -day common issues so that uh, uh, general public is fully aware about what the, what the challenges are. And at least they can pick it up early. That's number one. 
Number two, I think insight is on issues, especially related to women health. Are a there is there there are a lot of inhibitions to discuss these issues. There are privacy concerns as well, and I think uh, making it accessible is a big, big idea, and technology is making it feasible now. I think uh, as Sunita mentioned about uh, tele consult or tele health or stuff like that. I actually would say that use of technology to make it accessible is a big idea. And I would actually put few points below that. One is if there is some kind of screening tool that is there now you can actually use all these variables you can do various now home kits that are coming in self monitoring stuff so it's just do it yourself kits at home I would put all that as a part of a screening at home. The second big ticket item would be the point of care testing. Now it can be done at home. It can also be done at uh, a physician's clinic. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, it's if it's difficult to step out, it's difficult to have access to a doctor, teleconsult is another big idea. So if I would just sum up two things, one is massive effort on awareness so that you start taking action at a very early stage. And the second would be make it accessible and use technology to make it accessible. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Om. Uh, Dr. Atul, your, your final thoughts as well. There are a couple of questions as well, which I will address, but, but let's get your final uh, thoughts as well. Yes, Priyanka. So essentially, I could, you know, just ditto, ditto everything. I mean, I totally concur with what's been said. Uh, I would only say that one more thing that uh, over the past decade or two, we have managed to uh, create some wonderful islands of excellence, you know, our tertiary level setups, 800 of them which are NABH accredited and which truly are second to none in the world. You know, they are providing world class, this thing. But now time has come, one, to create awareness and create the basics of patient safety goal. Because if we are to prevent future such calamities, uh, then we have to use te technology responsibly and take take all the basics, you know, basics of hand hygiene, basics of surgical safety checklist, basics of communication matrix to tier five, tier six cities, to, to the last uh, man in the line or rather last woman in the line. Because unless we do that, I mean, unless we change, because these are the, you know, uh, what what's the good word? Uh, the, these are the uh, rate limiting steps. Unless we create, uh, absolutely people are aware to the last T, I mean, to in the farthest corner of uh, our country, wide country. Uh, till then, um, I mean, these these waves will keep on coming. So that is one. And technology has to be used very, very responsibly. So we should have basics SOPs. I mean, basics, I mean, five things, six things, core areas, which we must disseminate like never before and uh, use technology for that and use it responsibly, follow standards, and maybe revamp and rethink the entire federal structure of the healthcare. I mean, it's too broad a dream, but I mean, 29 different st states and UTs and following their own and doing their own call. So we need to have a centralized system, you know? Uh, healthcare has to be totally revamped and be back in a priority zone as it is coming nowadays. So very optimistic about it, but that has to be the key. Thanks, uh, Dr. Atul, as well. Let me summarize all of what uh, you shared, all of you shared, I think, which are all powerful ideas and perhaps, uh, you know, pretty comprehensive as well. So awareness, access through both telemedicine and uh, Dr. Alexander, what you spoke about, actual, you know, making, making the announcement of the health and wellness centers a reality in letter and in spirit uh, to focus more on preventive and primary. And then, of course, all of this sitting on a foundation of data analytics, Dr. Sunita, as you spoke about, to have targeted interventions, but also, Dr. Atul, what you spoke about, the foundation of SOPs and quality on which uh, this can sit. Uh, so that I, I think you know, this perhaps provides a lot of ideas on, on where to go. Uh, maybe that's, that's where I'd like to summarize it. There are one or two questions. I, I think uh, we still have another few minutes, so I'll address the uh, audience questions to some of you. I think one of the questions that's come in, um, and I'll try to interpret it, it says, will real people be able to use the innovation? I guess the question really is that, maybe let me rephrase the question to say, ha have any of you, for example, leveraged telemedicine over the last uh, many months and what has your be experience been? And do you think that if we think of the journey of a 
woman in rural india she will be able to use it i i have used it definitely in the in the past uh, you know months uh, but perhaps my journey is quite different from let's say a woman sitting in rural india so if you could share you know how does it really come to the ground level uh, last mile and and do you think there are still some changes required there i could take that uh, priyanka because we extensively yeah. used it uh, just to give an example and, and i agree with you that you know our city girls would all have used it today right uh, you know with the different apps but um, during covid you know one of the things we had done which a lot of people did was covid care at home and that essentially means that you monitor the patient at home they have their pulse ox and you know you get you you have a nurse check in every day in the us they have uh, apps check in every day in india we had nurses check in every day and then doctors as needed so this was complete tele monitoring and telemedicine uh, and then we rolled it out actually with help of a generous grant uh, for free to patients who couldn't afford it Uh, and through ngos it got rolled out in uttar pradesh and we had doctors who spoke different languages because that's one key thing we realized we can't just have a you know bangalore city doctor trying to treat these patients in a village in up so we had doctors who spoke hindi bengali malayali tamil telugu and kannada um and so the the language was very key with it uh, and we also realized they were not able to do the whole app part um so so we just kind of changed the model and said okay what do you have do you have whatsapp do most of them had whatsapp so then we would do whatsapp video uh so we had to i think in order to help help them use it we had to work with them some didn't even have whatsapp they had regular phone so we said okay are you okay with audio we'll just do a regular phone call but it was amazing i mean i think for these patients who sit in rural areas feeling unsupported perhaps with you know am i getting the right treatment am i not to know that they have a city doctor who's managed covid handling their care telling them what to do what not to do when they should start steroids when they shouldn't be taking steroids it, it was priceless uh, we were able to keep 98% of patients out of the hospital um and uh, you, you know actually did sessions for a lot of rural ngos uh, as well as worked with cmc velo with their outpatient protocols so it's i would say telemedicine you got to be flexible it is true if you want everyone to use it it may not be that fancy app that you download on your smartphone and with one click you pay and get your payment gateway and get your doctor uh, so i think healthcare providers hospitals clinics individual doctors will have to use multiple technologies based on what their patients can or cannot do uh, of course all indians you know today the mobiles are everywhere uh, so we we realized one we had to do a lot of training also on what they had to do even simple things like the pulse ox you know how do you put it on if they had nail polish then suddenly the saturation is 60% but they're looking pink you know so it's you a lot of training which is at the ground level to be able to enable people to actually use this tech and once they use it and once they experience it uh, i think they feel very supported because they're kind of getting the the medical support that they couldn't get you know where they are um and and uh, it's it were it's a i think covid has taught us that all this is very possible now it's a question of continuing it with other diseases uh in the similar fashion and with the same passion and same energy and same training and same awareness you know and and kind of spreading all of that great uh, dr sneeta you definitely uh, give us even priyanka thoughts. just quickly highlight one public effort also so that for the real people actually so this is the e sanjeevni project uh, which has been around for about 15 years and this has suddenly found its calling uh, a million plus prescriptions have been doled out by the best specialist in the country the entire aims uh, faculties on it the entire uh, uh, government facility it's currently only for the government it's a totally free gratis i mean public funded project e sanjeevani so one just has to log on create a appointment around the clock and best specialist from the best institution in the country and already there are million plus free prescription i mean uh, consultation which have already happened and and besides that every state is doing its bit there are there are every channel where public funded hospitals are reaching out to people and these are the real people with real advice 
and private is obviously doing its bit. I mean, for all those platforms, being a dermatologist, I know that uh, about 15,000 registered IADVL members are offering not only free, but uh, I mean, not only paid, but also free consultations in, um, in as to the maximum ability. So all hands on the deck. I think one more point, important point, I think during this COVID pandemic, many, many lives were saved because of the use of telemedicine and running uh, e-ICUs. Uh, I, I think because of the shortage of pulmonologists in critical care units, many ICUs in Tier 2, Tier 3 cities were remotely managing patients, and this helped a great deal. Yeah, no, I think all, uh, I think very, very optimistic, uh, you know, messages from all three of you and exactly the note uh, perhaps we want to end this at, that in this crisis there's also been a lot of opportunity. And the hope is that we carry this forward uh, to reimagine how healthcare for women will be delivered in, in years to come. I think we're just at time. So thank you so much, uh, Om, Dr. Alexander, Dr. Sunita, Dr. Atul, for sharing your perspectives, but also uh, you know, uh, creating the, the opportunity and the narrative for hope uh, on how we carry healthcare forward in India. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tell you all the way. Well, uh, Priyanka, I would like to say dot on time and absolutely uh, the way you just said the last line summed it up perfectly and just the right vibe. I have to say a thank you to the entire panel for you know just deep diving into the women's health and also the technologies that you spoke of that indeed are disrupting the space, you know, when you talk about reproduction health, the disease, the wellness at the same time. So how really I felt that convention itself has become unconventional. So we have no choice but to adapt coercively. Thank you very, very much to our moderator and of course the panel right out there. But with that delegates, we all understand, uh, I hope the need of robust and vibrant ecosystem for quality healthcare for women across nations. Well, the upcoming sessions, ladies and gentlemen, with the experts from the healthcare ecosystem will talk just that. It's gonna be one-on-one, -on -one. We will be right back. Just stay tuned. And, you know, I'm going to ask you to use the official hashtag and talk about all your key learnings on social media. Let's just, as I said, collaboration is the buzzword at our summit. So let's be collaborative there. See you in a bit. Mm -hmm.